Thank you. Um, well, hello, and uh, thank you for coming to see my talk on the Diapi skier. Like you said, I'm, I'm uh, Eric Lasby. And uh, the Diaffy Skater is a, an IDA Pro plugin that, that we created at uh, Riverside to uh, essentially remove obfuscation that we found in our malware and uh, uh, protections that we analyzed for commercial companies. And, and um, uh, mostly malware is, is where we get our, our patterns and that sort of thing, so um, nothing proprietary. Um, so I'm going to go over the problem of obfuscation, kind of describe what it is, what it looks like, and then I'm going to give you an example of some uh, malware that we looked at, Rustock B. Um, it has a, a decryption routine that's just full of uh, obfuscation. And uh, I'm going to show you our solution and describe how it works, and then give you a, uh, an in-presentation demonstration of um, what the deobfuscator does. And then I'll show you Rustock B before uh, deobfuscation and then after. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of sample source code and um, just give you an idea of, of how we deal with uh, a simple peephole pattern. And, uh, and then sum it all up. So first, obfuscation. Um, what is it? Some, something that malware authors use a lot to hide their malicious code. Um, they'll do things like anti-disassembly techniques just to try to trick uh, IDA Pro, OLLI, whatever your disassembler is, and into uh, thinking that maybe certain regions of code aren't, aren't uh, valid or visible, or they just try to fill it with junk so it's difficult to understand at, at first glance. Um, it costs reverse engineers lots of time. Like I said, disrupts control flow. Um, and removing it manually is difficult and tedious. Um, like I'll describe with uh, Rustock B, some reverse engineers have spent, you know, days, weeks looking at just the uh, decryption routine when really it's, it's pretty simple and just full of garbage. So here's an example of one that we uh, handle. We call it a push-pop math because you are pushing an immediate popping it into EDX here, and then XORing it with another immediate, and then we jump to that result. So the obfuscator on its first run would take this, emulate the result, just move that into EDX, no op all the junk instructions, and then if you ran it through a second um, run of the obfuscator, then you'd get a jump to that byte um, 4010 7B. Now to the example. Um, this is a good example. Like I said, it, it implements a lot of obfuscation patterns. And so, you know, whenever we come across a new malware, something that we haven't seen yet, we just take the common patterns, dump them into our deobfuscator, um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a one-time thing, so it doesn't take an incredible amount of time, and it saves us a ton of time. Um, we have all kinds of things like where we push registers onto the stack, and then further down we'll do some math on the registers. It all looks very complicated and valid. And then uh, they just pop the registers back off. And so lots of useless stuff, but then also a lot of things where they uh, obfuscate a key by doing math on it. And, and uh, so we just like to get at that, that core functionality faster without having to wade through the obfuscation. Um, they've also uh, obscured the control flow, mangled jumps, some things that, that IDA Pro uh, doesn't handle by default. So, Here's the control flow we started out with, all kinds of code flattening. I mean, this is one function, but it obviously isn't going to really have 25 different entry points and places to exit either. So, Let's look at a small piece of it. There's um, this is also more complicated than necessary. I'm going to show you there's unreferenced instructions. <clears throat> that doesn't seem to come from anywhere. We also have an obfuscated pop in the form of, um, let me get my mouse here. Um, you're moving uh, the value on top of the stack into EBX. And then here's an obfuscated jump right in the middle of that, um, which in the case of the obfuscator, 
we would, our first run would probably just get rid of this push ret, turn it into a jump, and then our next run would deal with this obfuscated pop where we then add ESP to four. Another type of obfuscated push, they do both pushes and pop, pops this way by doing uh, <clears throat> deck or ink ESP over and over and over again, and then uh, moving a value into a register or onto the stack. And here's an obfuscated, this, this obfuscated jump, these two, the push rets, those are uh, dealt with by Pro because apparently um, I had a discussion with Ilfac the other day, and he said that uh, apparently some compiler actually generates that, so that's why he handles it. Um, but this one, it, it's obfuscated a little more. They obfuscate the push and then do a ret, so it doesn't quite handle that. So I'm going to show you our solution, which is our deobfuscator plugin. Uh, we combine emulation techniques. We can uh, emulate math operations, emulate um, things going on in the stack. And um, we just do it on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. We find the beginning of a pattern, and then we emulate until that pattern no longer matches. And then we move on to the next uh, set of instructions and look for more patterns. Um, we try to determine the proper control flow using uh, um, get, getting rid of anti-disassembly. And uh, then we uh, transform the instructions to enhance readability and uh, for both static and dynamic analysis. Um, in dynamic, it's easy to, to see where code goes when, when the jumps go to the proper place the first time and you don't have to go around all over the place. And for static, it's easier to look at and that sort of thing. We have six basic modes of operation, one we've just recently added. Um, Anti-disassembly is the first thing you would want to do if you're running this plugin. Um, we replace anti-disassembly with uh, simplified code so that IDA can then reanalyze and you know, straighten out your control flow. Um, with passive, we have simple people rules. I'll kinda, kind of go into what a uh, people rule is briefly. Just uh, something really simple where there's not a lot of um, um, analysis to be done. Just like a uh, exchange EBX, EAX, and then followed by the exact same thing. We would just code that up real easy. And, uh, and it's passive because removing it is not a very risky thing to do as far as uh, changing the behavior of the code. And then we have aggressive rules. We make some assumptions about memory contents. We also um, track registers and um, some stack contents also. Uh, with Ultra, we make more aggressive assumptions. We track uh, multiple registers, whereas aggressive, I'm sorry, I said um, in aggressive, we usually just track one register at a time. Um, so you can choose uh, any of those four, uh, either exclusively or in combination, to uh, get the right deobfuscation level for your particular application. And then uh, with remove no ops, that's the thing that we do when, when it's all said and done and there are no more patterns being found by our first, uh, our first four modes. We want to jump over the, uh, the no ops that we've created um, just to, to make it look nicer and uh, so that you don't have to step through no ops when you're slogging. Um, collapse is sort of just a, an evolution of remove no ops. Instead of jumping over no ops, in this case, we take the function that you want to uh, deobfuscate and we just move all the instructions from, um, from below no ops or from in between no ops. We just move it all up so that you get, hopefully, one continuous code block. Um, it's invoked with Alt-Z, and you get this nice GUI. Like I said, you can, you can select any of these Diab levels up at the top in combination with each other. Um, remove no ops, that's something to be done by itself. You give it a start and end address. Usually, you want to do it by function. Um, weird things happen if you start going over the end of a function. But uh, also, we have collapse down below that. And you want to give it a start and end slack space. And the reason we did that is because sometimes you'll have, especially with uh, code that's intentionally obfuscated, you'll have functions that have chunks of other functions mixed in there and you don't want to just write over them. 
So give yourself enough room and find a good slack space that'll fit all of the function in, and then it'll just slap it in there. We use the structures created by IdaPro. Obviously, it's, it's uh, done the analysis for us, found all of the, the operands and that sort of thing. Uh, we can follow jumps and calls or not for anti-disassembly. Often, it's uh, better to just go straight from start to end address. Um, we can track registers and stack, and stack contents. Um, here's a piece of demonstration code that Jason put together. It's uh, protected to the gills with anti-disassembly um, obfuscation. It really only does one or two different things, but it's also a little bit longer than what it appears to be here. You can see there's an obfuscated jump at the end. We will need to do some calculation to uh, figure out what EDX is so we can then jump there. And when we run the, the obfuscator iteratively, it'll get rid of uh, <clears throat> all of this stuff eventually. Uh, the first run, we would want to run anti-disassembly, like I said. You, you'll you find like Jay-Z jump, call math. These are things that are preventing uh, analysis. A Jay-Z jump is, uh, we've got a couple of useless jumps at the beginning, um, and followed by a junk byte. That's, that's another thing. Since this is kind of like an empirical thing that we do, we just, we find obfuscation patterns and if it's common that there's a junk byte after that, then we say, hey, maybe there will be a junk byte. Let's look for that. And so it's in the pattern. So this jump goes to a no-op. The next jump goes to right after the no-op. Nothing. So we just no-op everything there, and it'll go on through. Next pattern is call math. Here, EDX is getting a return of a call, and then there's some math on the, on the EDX. So we'll just emulate the result and move it right into EDX, no op the rest, and it's done. Uh, the obfuscator outputs a text file, which you can see comes in the format of uh, um, we have a offset address, file offset, and then we give it an integer number of what bytes we're going to inject, and then just the bytes to inject on each line. And then we take our binary injector Perl script. It's pretty simple. And we just give it the arguments of uh, the text file and then the binary or copy of the binary if you want to keep your, your original for uh, dynamic analysis or in case you're afraid that you've messed up something that might be checksummed or whatever. Um, the new functionality we've added also is to just modify the IDAPRO database in place. Um, so you can, it makes it a lot faster to run the deobfuscator iteratively, and because uh, um, you can just patch there, run it again, patch, run, patch. Otherwise, you've got to run your uh, patching thing and then reload the, the database. So. so now we reload, or if we've done just our dynamic patching there, then we can see we've straightened out the control flow a little bit there. We got rid of the, the um, conditional jumps. And so now I'm going to describe why we want all this slack space. Let me go back here to the previous one. You notice we, we've got these no-ops here. And the reason that we don't want to immediately just jump over them or collapse this function into uh, something smaller um, is because the no-ops are useful um, in the interim for making more deobfuscations. So here's an example of why that, that's the case. Uh, let's say we've got a bunch of no-ops in between some instructions, and that's from a previous deobfuscation. Well, obviously, this can just be changed into a move instruction, which is only two bytes. But if our prior analysis has given us a value for EAX, then maybe we just want to move that immediate into EAX, and that's going to take a couple more bytes. So we, uh, we've given ourselves some space to do that. Um, the next run, we're going to run passive, aggressive, and ultra once we have gotten rid of uh, our anti disassembly. And we find a move math, move math, or pop twice. So let's see what those are. <clears throat> we move uh, an immediate into EAX, XOR it. And so we're just going to emulate that result 
and move it into EAX in the first place, and then no-op the, uh, the math instruction. Move math or pop, kind of simu similar, except we can, we can handle a couple cases here. If, if a register is overwritten with another move instruction, or if uh, something is popped off the stack into the register, it's a little bit more of a general pattern. So we get rid of the, the pointless instructions there and simplify it. To finish it all up, once we've uh, gone through and found all the patterns that we can, we're going to run one of those uh, either no op remove or collapse modes. And uh, I've already described those kind of. Um, here's an example showing no op remove. Um, in many cases, the uh, collapse mode is going to give you a little bit cleaner where you won't have the breaks between blocks and that sort of thing. You'll just have one nice uh, block of control flow. Um, but in this case, it doesn't make that much of a difference. So no op remove. You can see we've got tons of no ops left over from this whole thing. A block entirely made of no ops. We just um, yank that out. And then we write a jump right under the uh, last non-no op instruction. And uh, you can see this only this code actually only does a couple of things. So Rustock-D, um, obviously much bigger example. We're going to show you what it looks like after. And you can see it's all linear. I mean, there, there's some, and now you can, you can easily identify the structure of the loops and, uh, and really quickly tell what's going on here. So if, uh, yeah, let's look at it a little closer. <laughs> Um, you can see there's a, an outside loop, the blue line, and then there's a couple of nested loops going on there. And then down here we have two more independent loops before we uh, actually at the bottom jump into the, the real um, nasty code. Um, here's the decryption pseudo code that we were able to um, pretty quickly reverse engineer once we had uh, gone through the deobfuscation process, which that took all of maybe an hour or so. Um, you can see the structure of the loops. We have that out, blue outside loop, the two nested ones, and then the two independent loops at the bottom. Uh, to give you some sample source code, an idea of, of how the deobfuscator works, um, I'm not quite sure if we're going to be able to release the source code to the entire thing, but this gives you a feel for how you could do something similar yourself, maybe. Um, the problem of a null sub, a call null, uh, IDAPRO identifies it as a null sub. It knows that this just jumps to a return. But <clears throat> uh, it's ugly, and we could use the slack space in a number of different ways. So our simple solution is to, uh, we just identify if there's a call made, if the instruction we're looking at is a call, if it's of type O near, you know, using all of those nice SDK uh, uh, tools. And then we look at the address where it's going, see if that's a return. And if it is, we know up the whole bunch. So. Um, so in summary, I would say that the reason this is a useful tool is that lots of malware authors use obfuscation techniques uh, to hide their IP and uh, keep you from reverse engineering it. Also to evade antivirus software and that sort of thing. And uh, we detect and simplify a lot of those uh, patterns. And as we go, as we find more, we just add those to the database. And we don't really have to do anything with them after that. Ideas for future development, we've already done this. Patching, code collapsing, check that off. Um, it would be nice also to be able to add a sort of grammar, like a like a parser so that we could, um, so that people could, without needing the source code or needing to write source code for every pattern, uh, it'd be really cool if they could just kind of say, okay, I found this pattern, it's got a move of two, uh, you know, into a register of an immediate, and you could just write, write patterns in that way. We'd also like to black box control flow uh, to track successors and predecessors uh, across calls and jumps. Um, just so that we can determine if there's bogus control flow or, or a honey code that never really gets executed. It's just there for show. So that would eliminate a lot of uh, reverse engineering time. 
um, is my contact information. And uh, yeah, I guess now it's time for questions. Yes. How we generate the patterns. Okay. Um, well, I guess if what you're getting, how do you write the code for to to identify a pattern? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we figure it out just by uh, static analysis. So it does take a one-time sort of reverse engineering of, of what that pattern does and, and determining that it's either useless code or that, uh, that it does something that can be simplified, put into one or two instructions. Oh, the size of patterns? Uh, Generally, there may be two instructions, one instruction sometimes, um, not too big. I mean, each pattern is, and we try to keep them simple actually to, to make it more flexible as far as when it's meant to be run iteratively. So we want to find the most basic unit of pattern possible so that you can eliminate that unit of pattern and then that way, variations in patterns are, are caught on the next run, you know? Sure. Oh, seconds. I mean, each run of the deobfuscator, yeah, seconds, maybe five or 10 for something the size of uh, Rust Sock B. Of course, one issue that, that we do face that uh, I don't really see a way around it, but when you have uh, cross-references to code that, you know, it makes it more difficult to, to determine whether or not you can really change that code without affecting some other part of the program. So sometimes bogus cross-references will, will trip us up and when we're running in the, the more um, aggressive modes, then sometimes we'll just ignore that stuff. But other times, you know, if, if you want to make sure that things are safe, you just have to punt. Yes? Yeah, uh, especially in the case where the, the entire block is no ops. Um, well, that, that is the case where our, um, our iterativeness comes into, uh, into play. We would, we would first decide that that content of that block is, is um, can be simplified to something that is no ops, and then the next pass would obviously then remove the entire block by jumping over it or moving the other code into the uh, the first block. Um, no, actually, we've started to dabble in uh, in. Um, tracking the, the flag registers and, and what instructions affect, affect the flags in what, what ways so that we can hopefully get a handle on where the program is going to go. Like for, for example, we, we have some patterns that will determine if uh, an instruction is just setting up a, uh, a conditional jump to always go a particular way. Um, so we, uh, we're getting on handling that. Yes. Where 
I guess the short answer is no. Anyone, anyone else? All right, well, thank you.